Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. If you can't, just put your hand to your ear and I will speak louder. I will try not to hurt your ears. So if it is too loud or you don't like what I'm saying, you can always go like this. <laughs> and I will, what I can assure you is though, is that I will preach God's word the best that I know how. We come together as people who trust, who love God. I don't know what you, where you are in your journey with God, but I do know that we all come here because we're on a journey with God. We come here to remind each other, to share God's hope and God's joy and God's love. We come here as vulnerable people sharing our hurts, sharing those places that we desire so much, healing and love. We come here as a congregation because this is the day that the Lord has made, and so, amen, amen, amen. Let us listen to some prelude music as we get ready to worship. Morning, everyone. Join me in the call to worship. Oh God, my God, we seek you. Our spirits long for you. But your love, O oh God, is better than even life. Let us seek the Lord where God may be found. We will bless you as long as we live. Let us pray. Holy One, when we are alone in the desert, wandering through the wilderness, we call to you, for you are our help. Our souls cling to you. Come, God, and hold us up. Come, bring your presence and fill us with your peace. In the shadow of your wings, 
we will sing for joy. Amen. Our first hymn today is Come Thou Almighty King, found on page 148 in your green hymnal, and we will sing verse 1, 3, and 4. call to confession. With extravagant love and generous hospitality, Jesus Christ invites us to confess our sins and set down our burdens so that we may receive the fullness of all he gives, seeks to give. Please join in the prayer of confession. Lord of all, our path lives is off limit to you. You require us to be faithful in little and in much with our money, our time, and our talents. If there are practices in which we gain, mass gain, think of the spirit that we when we fall short and change our ways. Pour out coins, turn over tables, chase fire from us, whatever offends you, and keep us from our worship. Please continue with a time of silent confession. Whatever those things that are there that keep you in that place where you feel broken from God, where you feel broken from loved ones, broken from neighbors. Know this, that anything we have done, God knows already. Anything we have hidden, God has already seen. It. God's love for us and grace to us are higher than we have imagined, deeper than we have guessed. Before we have asked, God's mercies are already given, for God does not waste our struggles, but uses them 
to grow joy. The saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ died to save sinners. Brothers and sisters, believe the promise of the gospel in Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. Let us share Christ's peace with one another, for we are called to share Christ's peace with one another as Christ shared his peace with us. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share that peace of Christ with one another. This morning, in part in reaction to that very special gift that God of the peace of Christ, Mary is going to share now a piece of that peace of Christ with us, the joy of man's desire. I was listening when we were the things that we were saying, and I went, it's exactly what this song is about. Jesus, all that he has, he wants for us. And when we look to him, that's when we receive it.
Yeso, Yesu, joy of man's desiring, holy wisdom, love most bright, drawn by thee, our souls aspiring, soar to uncreated light. Word of God, our flesh that fashioned, when the fire of life and passion, striving still to truth unknown, soaring, dying round thy throne. Through the way where hope is guiding, hark, what peaceful music rings, where the flock in thee confiding, drink of joy from deathless springs. Theirs is beauty's fairest pleasure, theirs is wisdom's holiest treasure. Thou dost ever leave thine own in the love of joys unknown. <laughs> Mary, thank you. And if I under remember right, that piece was written by Johann Sebastian Bach. If I am wrong, I apologize. But every one of those notes, for those of you who know music or have studied music, those arpeggios that he's using, and the way in which they're played, every one of those individual notes works out together to create a sense of community of joy. Joy is not just happiness, but joy is a deep sense of also belonging and knowing that it's going to be okay. 
all of those notes put together. They didn't just happen. It took a community to create that music. Johan didn't just create this out of his imagination. It took generation after generation and teaching of handing down the stories of how things go together to work together for good. This morning, I'm going to be talking about money and coins. For those of you who are studying going through our Lenten time, we're going through various things. So we started out with dust and we had Ash Wednesday and then we moved to bread, the bread of life. And then Wendy last week did crosses and talked about cross. Today, it is coins. And in particular, coins is money. According to the um, Wikipedia's definition, money is any item or variable or vulnerable record that is generally accepted as payment for goods and services a repayment of debt, such as taxes, and a particular country or social economic context. The main function of monies are distinguished as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, a store of value, and sometimes a standard of deferred payment, any item or variable, or variable record that fulfills these functions can be considered money. So what I have is I've got some coins up here. I start off with some coins that were passed down to my father and to me, coins that are old. Some of these coins come, um, some of the earliest coins that the United States minted. Some of the coins also represent coins from other countries. Some of this coin, like this one, is not a coin, but it is a dollar bill. That was right during the time of the Civil War. That was from the state of Arkansas, worth one cent. <laughs> um, another bag of coins that I have, this one I keep in my car and has been there, and even though I don't need it now because I don't think Oregon has any toll roads. But when we were living in the Midwest, whenever we especially were traveling to Chicago, we would always get on the toll road and you needed to have coins to pop in there. And so this bag of quarters is, is what that represents. This is one of my favorite uh, things of coins, so it's kind of gotten a little mixed up, but it represents coins that I have found. Generally, it is, it is pennies because that's what you're more, most at the most, the least of value is what you oftentimes find. And I, ever since I was a little kid, I don't know where I picked it up from, but I believe it was probably handed down from my ancestors. But when you found a coin on the ground, you stuck it in your shoe for good luck. And as I got older, I began to, to use it as when I saw, especially a penny, I would pick it up and I would treat this penny as one of the most valuable of coins. Because I figured that if God, if I did treat the least of these things with great honor, why would God ever bless me with more? And I want to come back to that word bless because you heard me use it. Blessing again, it's not just something that God gives you that you that is like good luck or something very precious that God has given you in the sense of, oh, God blessed me with this. Anything that God blesses you with, with also holds great responsibility. The coins and the money we have hold great responsibility. The other thing, and all that I see that you're back there as well. I, I brought my Walt cordless drill. And as I was leaving this morning, I go, ah, that's another great example of what money is. Without this battery, this drill does not function. This battery, when I put it in, will make it work. This battery will eventually run dry if I keep running the drip. The only way to fill it back up is if I put it on my charger, and then it is like a bank. It stores up the money. It stores up the energy that I can use my drill. Money in many, many ways is like a battery. It is energy. When we work, for money, 
we're storing up energy to be used in another way. It's a way of exchanging this for that. I'm going to move back to the pulpit. We're going to use some scriptures. Coins, money, wealth, poverty, buying and selling, which is consumerism, value, inheritance, wages, inflation, taxes, tithing, economics. What do all of these things have to do with God? Everything or nothing depending upon your understanding of truth. Again, everything or nothing, depending upon your understanding of truth. The first scripture I want to read this morning comes from Mark chapter 12. And it wasn't long ago when I preached from this, this scripture. The question about paying taxes. Then they sent him some Pharisees, that is to Jesus, and some Herodians to trap him in what he said. And they came and they said to him, teacher, we know that you are sincere and you show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Again, that word truth. Depending on your idea of truth. There are times when the truth, all of a sudden we understand this truth and that truth all of a sudden changes how we operate in the world around us. There is a truth that God has given to the world and it is called the Messiah, but there were many who did not believe that this was the Messiah. And so they're questioning, is this the true Messiah? And rightfully so, we should always question. But at some point, you may have to stick your finger in a wound like Thomas did and believe. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you putting me to the test? Bring me a denarius, let me see it. And they brought one. And then he said to them, whose head is this? And whose title? And they answered, the emperor's. And Jesus said to them, give to the emperor the things that are to the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. So why, so what do taxes have to do with God? Why do we pay taxes? Why give to God? This idea of taxes or what is it, or to whom is it that is our bottom line in the world? Taxes, are they good, are they bad? Taxes are one way in which um, a community of people share their resources in order to make sure that things will run together for the good of the whole. Stoplights, roads, the bridge out there that connects us to the rest of the world, those were all paid by taxes. Taxes was not always something that this government believed in or had, but once taxes began to be collected and used, we were able to make a battery in a sense that gave this country the ability to move and to work in the world around us. But do we worship this country? To whom do we ultimately bow down to as those who believe in Jesus Christ and in that truth, to whom and to what do we give to God and what do we give to country? Our taxes are simply a way of putting money or putting energy into the battery so that not only us but that generations to come will have something in order to move and to live in the world around it. The next lesson I want to read comes from Luke. 
the parable of the lost. By this time, a lot of men and women of questionable reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and the religious scholars were not pleased at all. They growled. He takes in sinners and he eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. And their grumbling triggered this story from Jesus. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and you lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? And when found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing. And when you got home, call in your friends and your neighbors saying, celebrate with me. I have found my lost sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people in no need of rescue. Or imagine a woman who has 10 coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and scour the house, looking at every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it, you can be sure she'll call in her friends and neighbors and celebrate with me. I have found my lost coin, count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. And the next story that comes after that Jesus tells is the story of the prodigal son. If I asked you what the meaning of the word prodigal meant, most of you would probably say it must mean something to do with the disobedient or the, the son that, that, that goes off with its inheritance, spends it all. It must be someone that is reckless with life. You'd be partially correct, but the prodigal son is named prodigal because the word prodigal means extravagant. The father is extravagant with the son who spent all his inheritance, who goes off and does this and gambles and loses all of his money and then comes back having worked in a, with, a, as, with a pig herder and then comes back and begs to just be a servant for at least then he would have food to eat and shelter to keep us warm. And the father not only provides that, but he takes off his coat. He gives him the fine coat. He gives him the ring. And the older son who has everything goes off angry. Extravagant. What do we value? All the way from the shepherd who values his sheep to the woman who values what little coin she has left to the prodigal son, the value. The father values life. In some ways, it all comes down to that point. What is most valuable to you? Will it be money, having a big bank account? Will it be in those physical things that you have or will your bank account be in people and in your relationships? What does money have to do with God and what is the truth of that? The next lesson comes from Luke 21. Just then he looked up and he saw the rich people dropping offerings in the collection plate. And then he saw a poor widow put in two pennies and he said, the plain truth is that this widow has given by far the largest offering today. All these others made offerings that they'll never miss. But she gave extravagantly what she could not afford. She gave her all. Rich and poor, we all give. And where is that place where we give? Do you give to that place that you can afford? Or do you, are you willing to give even more? That place where you give, like the farmer who is on the brink of starvation and has a little bit of food left in their bag of seeds that is wheat. And they have to make a decision do I go without food or do I plant those remaining seeds that I have for tomorrow in hopes 
that I will get a harvest. It hurts. It's not just giving for the willingness to be hurt, but it is giving so that others will have, even if it isn't for your own life today, but for those who will come tomorrow. It's hard to invest in tomorrow, but sometimes God requires that of us. The widow was willing to give extravagantly. From John 2, 13 through 22, when the Passover feast was celebrated, each spring by the Jews was about to take place. Jesus traveled up to Jerusalem and he found the temple teeming with people, selling cattle and sheep and doves. The lone sharks were there also in their full strength. And Jesus put together a whip out of strips of leather and he chased them out of the temple, stampeding the sheep and the cattle, upending the tables and the loan sharks, spilling coins left and right. And he told the dove merchants, get your things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a shopping mall. And that's when his disciples remembered the scripture, the zeal for your house consumes me. What is going on in this story? is that at that time when Jesus was there at the temple, there were sacrifices that needed to be made for this and for that. And in order to get the doves, it cost you money. You didn't always have money, and so you borrowed money from the loan sharks who were willing to give you the money in order to buy the sacrifice so that God would give you whatever it was that you needed or that you are able to give to God so that God will love you. Something physical is done in order to get God's approval or God's love. Jesus was not happy with that. What is the truth in that? What do you understand from scripture? Why was it that Jesus was angry with those merchants that were doing what they were doing? that story, it is not long after that when Jesus is asked about the temple and when Jesus says this very temple will come down in three days, but then it will be rebuilt. What temple was he talking about? Churches oftentimes get caught into that realm where you need something bigger and better physically. What is it that we need? What houses of worship do we need? Where and how does a church spend its money? What is the truth of what we need to do? When is it what we do where God will take and turn over our tables and set us on the right path again? Reading from Mark chapter 10. What's the price of a pet canary? Some lose, some lose change, right? A canary is not worth it. And God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you, down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bulky talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Again, this idea of money and worth. Stand up for me against the world's opinion, and I will stand up for you before my Father in heaven. If you turn tail and run, do you think I will cover for you? Don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut, make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law, cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and you look to me, you will find both yourself and me. 
Now that is a translation by Eugene Peterson, who writes what we understand from the Greek and the Latin, and the Greek and the Hebrew and the Latin. But I think that Eugene Peterson's got a pretty good sense of the English language and how we can best interpret it. It doesn't mean that we are to hate mother and father. What it simply says is what is most important to you? What is most important? None of us want to lose those whom we love and hold on to so much. But we do also know that death is a part of our life. And ultimately, it is our relationship with God that is the most important. And what I have found to be true is that if you will give your heart first to God, bend your knee and humble yourself to God and to love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and your neighbor as yourself. If you will accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what I have found to give testimony to is that God will continue to bless you in these other things as well. It doesn't mean you won't have to say goodbye to those who you love so much, but God's will be there. And you will be more than okay. You will be able to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And so I rejoice. I rejoice. The last scripture, not the last one yet. There's two more. The next one is from Ezra. This one's a little bit harder to get at. But you need to know the story from Ezra. So what has happened is, is that the Israelites, they are taken captive. They were told that they would be taken captive and they get taken captive into Babylon. And after 50 years, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar allows them to go back. And so all the various tribes of Israel are coming back to Israel. And Ezra, from he was a prophet, says this. He said, and this is what they do when they come back. And in the scripture of Ezra, as you're reading through it, you'll get and you'll get a sense of all the many people who come back from Babylon to Israel, but also what they do when they come back. And so Ezra chapter 2, 64 through 69. Some of the heads of the family on arriving at the temple of God in Jerusalem made fair free will offerings toward the rebuilding of the temple of God on its site. They gave to the building fund as they were able, about 1,100 pounds of gold, about three tons of silver, and 100 priestly robes. Why would they do that? Because the temple had been destroyed. And what they want to redo is to rebuild that temple of God where they can worship. They were willing to sacrifice. The idea of tithing was not free will. The, the idea of tithing, like taxes, was 10% of what you had. So whether it was a crop that you grew, you gave 10% back to God. Whether it was your, your, your sheep, when you slaughtered them, you gave 10% back to God, to the temple. If you worked for wages, you gave 10% of that to God. The free will offering is that which you gave over and above. So those people who came back, now how they were able to store up that much wealth being over in Babylon, I do not exactly know. But they came back and they collected it and they used it and they began to rebuild Israel, Jerusalem, the temple. You can read all about it. Some of the things I get very discouraged about what they do but this part, they were willing to rebuild. Rebuild it. Can you imagine what it's going to take to rebuild Ukraine after so much destruction? What will it take to rebuild Syria after so much destruction? What does it take to rebuild Kentucky after so much destruction? This morning, I heard a great story about um, a music teacher in a high school who saw and knew that so many schools and so many places where musical instruments were had been destroyed because of that big tornado that went all the way across the state. 
and that this morning they are donating over a thousand instruments that has been collected because people gave generously to the rebuilding of something that had been destroyed. What is it that we value that needs to be rebuilt and are we willing to give to it so that it can be rebuilt over and above what you give to God? The next is from Matthew. And this is the ending point. Then one of the 12 who was called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Judas, Judas worked for money. As I was thinking about Judas, in many ways, he was um, a kind of a mission. Someone who was willing to show others where Jesus can be found. Judas showed those Jewish leaders where Jesus could be found. Showed the Romans where Jesus could be found. And they paid him for that. They gave him 30 pieces of silver. But Judas also knew that this would be, that Jesus would be, um, put into custody and would probably be killed for what he did. Judas does not feel great about this money. Judas, in many ways, did not even want this money. But by taking that money, that's what sealed the contract. Money made the contract happen. As long as Judas took that, then the contract was sealed and they could go forward. Money holds a place in our life and how we do things. It's not always just to buy something with it. Sometimes it seals us and it tells us who we are. We have an opportunity always to tell about the good news of Jesus Christ. Judas, in a strange way, is part of the story that Jesus knew. I believe that Jesus does forgive Judas for what he does. But I also don't know that Judas forgave himself before he dies. Does not know that Jesus so loved him that he even forgave him for betraying him into the hands. We all are like Judas in some ways. At some point in our life, we will betray God. We betray God with the resources that we have. We betray God in ways of not just sharing the good news when we've had opportunities. We betray God when we don't stand up for someone, when they are being belittled by others. We keep our mouths quiet. But what we do to the least of these, we do to God as well. Our money. What is the truth? concerning our money and its relationship to God. What is our reality? What is our understanding? Coins, money, wealth, poverty, buying, selling, value, inheritance, wages, inflation, taxes, tithing, economics. What do all of these have to do with God? Everything or nothing, depending on your understanding. Let us pray. God, we thank you for those who invested with their resources, your scriptures that have been handed down and protected and preserved for us this very day here, whether we're on Zoom, whether we're here in person or listening to this sermon on a recording. God, you have given us your scriptures to learn from, to grow from, to help us to be your children. God, we know that you are our good news. 
you give us life and everything that we have is yours. Help us to believe in your truth concerning all things. And so in your precious name, In your bulletins, there is an affirmation of faith. And if you'd be willing to read along with this, please join with me. To be reconciled to God is to be sent into the world as God's reconciling community. This community, the church universal, is entrusted with God's message of reconciliation and shares God's labor of healing the enmities which separate people from God and from each other. Our hymn is, Lord, you have come to the lake shore. And I'm hoping maybe all of you will sing a little bit louder than me. <laughs> but we will sing this song together.
the announcements this morning. Um, the session met this week and we talked about masks again. Are we, because of the state has lifted the mask mandate, but yet every single um, organization, every single store has the right to continue to uh, require that people wear masks. After discussion, session elders voted to keep our mask mandate in force for just another month. We will revisit it then and decide whether or not to keep making it a mandate. Masks are required when in the building and especially when singing. The N95 masks are the most effective for protecting yourself, but you may wear whichever one is more comfortable. Again, the N95s and hopefully we will have um, a stockpile of them. We've ordered about a hundred or so for this congregation to use and to give out, but the N95s are the ones that protect you. The surgical masks are good for protecting other people from your breath, but the N95s are there for you. So if you are very vulnerable, um, please get one. And I would just say if, you, if we don't have them in next week and you need to get one, I will make sure that you get one no matter what. Um, on Wednesday, March 23rd, the Worship and Music uh, Committee will be meeting at two o'clock via Zoom. I will send out that invitation and if you would like to be a part of that, even if you're not on the committee, please let us know and we'll get you one. On Thursday, we will continue with our Lenten devotion where we are studying it. And this coming week, we will be studying more in depth the idea about coins and money. It starts at six o'clock, but everyone is invited to come and join in at 5.30. We open up that Zoom about quarter after five, and at 5.30 for those who would like some fellowship with each other. <laughs> Joyce, I love that. <laughs> That's what happens when paper gets dropped on the foot pegs and you bend down to pick it up. <laughs> Um, so I was talking about the Lenten devotion, and when we do that, we try to give opportunity for people to share. It's not just lecture-based, but people will have the opportunity to share with one another on Zoom some of the things they've been learning and growing from as we've been going through these symbols that we use this year with um, Lent. And the other reason why you might want to join at 530, because it's a good opportunity to meet some of your neighbors from the chapel by the sea, Presbyterian Church to the north that Wendy and I also serve. And then on Saturday is our community breakfast and our food box giveaway. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, then I would ask Scott to come forward and give us a minute for mission. And as he's coming forward, I will say this, that this last Saturday we served 53 breakfasts and 18 boxes were given away in bags that will feed 47 people. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes, uh, this time of year, it's every once in a while, it's a familiar. Uh, uh, during the week, uh, Celebrate uh, that God connects us with, uh, with us through Jesus' resurrection. It connects us with those who have the least. And you know, insert in your, in your bulletin, you'll see a picture of uh, a woman sitting on a uh, wreckage of someone's home, possibly her own. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, that's, this is what uh, we, one great hour of sharing is all about. People who experience oppression, uh, need, loss, or lack, those are the people that Jesus connected with, the Bible says. And they are the people we are invited to connect with today. And uh, uh, those fleeing from the uh, battle uh, in uh, Ukraine are, are part of this. 
One wave out of, out of Sharon is the single largest way that the Presbyterian churches all come together to uh, work for, the, for a better world. Each uh, gift to one great hour of sharing helps improve the lives of suffering and the vulnerable through free life-saving programs. The uh, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, Presbyterian Hunger Program, and this self-development of people. So please, uh, uh, as you think about this through the uh, season of Lent, uh, remember that the uh, humble that's there, and and uh, and and, uh, and please uh, give to the uh, one great hour of sharing. It's one of the four for four offerings. The four offerings is probably the largest of the four uh, that happen throughout our church here. Thank you. God, I know you didn't have a microphone, but you have a good, strong voice. But again, um, Scott was sharing with us the one great hour of sharing offering. Again, not that we as a congregation require tithing, but tithing, as we understand it in this congregation, is oftentimes what that is a pledge in the sense of every year we ask for pledges of resources, of time, and talent. Your pledges go to support the running of this church, the keeping of this building working, the paying for pastors, the, all of the, uh, the Zoom equipment, the organ, keep all of those things. That's where our ties go to generally. Um, the free will offering is what we would consider the one great hour of sharing or some of the other things that we do with the the, the, the Christmas toys that we do, those are free will offerings. The offerings that are given on Saturday mornings that support the breakfast. And I think um, those kind of offerings are always important to give. The offerings that you give as an individual to the needs around the world. Um, again, money is but one part of the ways in which we give back to God. Prayers of the people. What are your prayers? Some of the prayers that we have that are in your bulletin for Anna's daughter-in-law, Jody, who has cancer. We need to pray for her for healing. For Scott and Fran's grandson, Paul, who is experiencing PTSD, and Benjamin, who has cancer. For Lyle, for your continued health. And for Laura, their daughter-in-law, for her health, is that correct? For Chuck and Sylvia, for life issues, and for the people of Ukraine. And I would add to that, to the people of Russia, and for all of those places where war is experienced. What are some of your other prayers this morning? Yes, Mary. I would send all persons who has been going through horrendous, horrible, horrible things, losing their children, mothers, and their families. Not just in other countries, here as well. Pray for this group. For every single person who has been going through horrendous situations and things, losing people that they love and others, not just in other countries, but in this country as well. Thank you, Mary. We will keep that in our prayers. Others today. I know that all of us do have prayers. Some are deeper. Some of those we want to keep private to ourselves, and so we will lift those up as well. Let us go to a time of prayer. And so God, for those prayers that we have, not only just prayers for needs, but also for praise, 
for your good news in the world around us. We thank you, God, that for those who reached out and saw the need for musical instruments in a place that had been devastated by a tornado, and for the generosity and the love of those who gave to them, for that teacher who saw the need and wanted it for all people and kids to have that musical instrument. We give you praise. We give you praise for the Saturday breakfast and the food box giveaway program and for its volunteers, for those that are willing to serve with their time and their energy and their imagination, for those who are willing to share with their resources. God, we do lift up. We do lift up these prayers for all those who are suffering, suffering because of the loss of loved ones, loss of homes, loss of relationships, of families, of broken homes, separated from children, whether through decisions or through injury or death. God, we lift those up to you and ask that your peace would be there. We pray for those who need your healing touch, for Jody and for her cancer. God, that you would heal her. For Paul and his PTSD, for Benjamin and his cancer, for health, for Lyle, and for Laura. Pray for those life issues that Chuck and Sylvia are experiencing. God, we lift up the people in Ukraine for those who are fighting, for those who are surviving, for those who are caring for the needs, for those who are starving to death, for those who need water, for care, for those who just want peace, for those who are displaced, living in other countries and other homes and in other places. God, watch over them and care for them. We pray for all of the soldiers on both sides. God, that your love and your peace will be there and that people would stand up for the ways of peace, that they would lay down their arms, that they would reach out between each other and find a way to live with each other we pray for the leaders of our world, for those in Ukraine and in Russia and in Turkey and the United States and other places. God, the world is going through times of torment. And we ask that your love would reign supreme in those places. God, we lift up those places that are devastated by earth. climate change, that we could be a piece of, that we could be stewards of care for the world that you've given us, that we could hand it on to the next generation in better condition in which we were handed it to. God, you taught us to pray. And so we pray together as your people saying, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now it's a time in which we give back to God. God gives to us everything. And we give back to God everything through our offerings. Not just our 10%, but we offer back to God all of our resources, our energies, and our time to God. And so let us sing this doxology together.
offer back to you that which you've given to us. That that which we plant today would provide a harvest a thousand times that which has been planted. That all of your children may be fed, not with just food, but with your love and your care. And so in the name of our Creator, in the name of Jesus Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, we dedicate these gifts to you. Amen. And our closing hymn is Let All Things Now Living found on page 22. Thank you.